Are you interested in learning how I made the embroidery on the sleeve of this gown? Then stay tuned as you stumble through the agony and the ecstasy of my creative process. For many years, I had been longing, intending, wishing, etc., to recreate the ornately embroidered sleeves of 15th century Italian gowns, but I was intimidated, yes, I was intimidated, by the level of mastery I thought I would need to do such a project justice. Specifically the metalwork aspect of the piece that I sort of felt uh, it, such slender would demand. Then, in March 2020, the world shut down. <laughs> Suddenly, I was no longer spending time traveling or going to medieval events or going much of anywhere, actually. And lo, I had a lot more time on my hands and a lot more energy to be creative and specifically to experiment. Thus, my heraldic embroidery sleeve dream project became a reality. <laughs> Picking the basic motif didn't pose any sort of barrier for me whatsoever. For those of you who know me, you know that I'm basically obsessed with the heraldic lily called the fleur de lis in French or the giglio in Italian. It's in my personal armorial and the general symbol of my house. So the question then became, which style? Because of course, the specific shape and ornament of the lily varies by geography and area. I could have picked the Florentine Gio, and I plan to do so for a future project, but the one that really caught my eye was the motif of the brocade of this adoration of the Magi. The color combination and texture simply sang to me with a seductive tune. So, motif chosen, I had to make a major decision. Did I wish to embroider directly onto the sleeve or to embroider a separate ground and then applique it? A lot of heraldic embroidery, such as banners and wall hangings, involve applique embroidery pieces. And although 100 years before the date of my gown, the extant jupon of the Black Prince also features gold worked leopards worked on linen and then applique onto the velvet. And I know it's not in great shape, but you get the picture. Because the target sleeve had already been completed, and I would have to pick it apart to embroider it and then refinish it, and because it's so much more practical to have an easily removable piece of embroidery, um, you know, when this sleeve dies, and it will, all Contessa clothes are doomed to die on the altar of my vanity then I can simply transfer the embroidery elsewhere, which just makes it much more practical. I therefore chose the applique option. So, brief message from our sponsor, me. If you're enjoying the content, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and click on the notification bell. And if you wish to support my endeavors and benefit from a host of perks, please consider becoming a Patreon on, patron on my Patreon. Link in the details. Okay. Back to your regularly scheduled Contessa. Next step, once I chose the motif and the technique, was the materials. I had acquired gloriously relucent silk embroidery silk, not or thread, not floss, from Korea back in 2014 with exactly the intention of doing such a project. And now, six years later, it was finally time. I went with the colors in the altar piece, blue, red, and metallic gold. For the metallic gold, I chose to use DMC metal embroidery thread rather than to splurge out on super expensive real metal thread. That being metal foil wrapped around a silk core for those who don't know what real metal thread uh, for embroidery is. Uh, or real gold thread, which is gold foil wrapped around a silk core, even more expensive. Because this embroidery was an experiment, and honestly I saw no point in possibly wasting super expensive materials on it. In fact, I've never actually worked with real gold thread, but that will be coming now. So for the ground, I selected the option that countless 15th century embroiderers also chose, the highly prosaic yet user-friendly linen. In keeping with a medieval sense of thrift, every scrap of fabric being utilized, I chose a scrap of yellow linen from my cabbage patch. Yes, I know there's a massive amount of debate over whether dyed linen was utilized in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, but we do actually have ample evidence of saffron being used to dye linen yellow. So this choice is potentially accidentally authentic, even though 
in fairness to intellectual honesty, most of the applique embroideries I've seen from this era are on undyed linen, which you can see through the spots that have worn away. But bonus in using this golden color is that it will hide any flaws in my metalwork. And there will be plenty, as you will see. Go big or go home with one's mistakes. That's the Contessa way. Okay, motif and materials chosen. I framed everything up in my medieval frame. See here. Inspired by the one seen in this fresco. But I still needed to transfer the pattern. And so. I had to create a pattern, actually. I had to draft it myself. I therefore sketched up my sleeve size version of this fleur-de-lis and prepared it for transfer. I decided on the medieval prick and pounce method, for which we have extant examples of such patterns, albeit on vellum instead of paper. I actually have vellum and had it at the time. I could have gone for the ultra authentic here, but for expediency decided against that. The next major embroidery project will, however, involve a vellum pattern, and you'll see that here on this channel. So prick and pounce is a simple but time-consuming method. One must prick tiny holes in the pattern, fairly close, and then pounce them using powder. I went with blue chalk in this case, black charcoal would have been more authentic, which I now have on hand, but at the time supply chains were severely problematic, you may recall, March 2020, oh, great time. So I utilized a metal stylus, which was much kinder on my calloused fingers than the needle I started using. And it also created holes that were actually big enough for the powder to penetrate. The pouncing process drives the powder through the holes, successfully transferring the pattern onto the fabric. So the pattern having been framed up, I pinned the paper onto the mounted fabric. And like the embroideress in this one cut, I pounced, 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 pounced just like a delicately hungry cat attempting to subdue its meal. Next, I followed Chinino Chinini's advice on transferring embroidery patterns and went over it in pen. Now, I will confess, I used a modern felt tip pen after filling an experiment using ink and quill. My ink was simply too watery and my quill not finely tipped enough. It was, it was just a mess. I now know, though, of someone who makes reproduction medieval pens like this one, and will be procuring one and experimenting more with a thicker medieval ink later on. Um, sidebar, if you are interested in medieval handcrafts and arts, and the actual process and materials used, you must procure a copy of Cianino Cianini's handbook. Absolutely essential, really. Inexpensive, get one. I have two. So. I will admit that this was my first time attempting the pouncing transfer technique, and it actually turned out only semi-successfully. Once I had traced the pattern in pen, I realized that something must have slipped during pouncing and the top half of the fleur-de-lis was off kilter. As you can see from the ungraceful Rorschach test of lines here. No, you are not suffering from a brain hemorrhage. That is me having gone back over the pattern to straighten it up. But this... Uh, visual mess does not really matter aesthetically because this will be entirely entombed in embroidery and the unwanted bits of fabric just cut away. Which is a frustrating lesson learned that we will cover at the end, that thing about the fabric. So stay tuned. <laughs> uh, sorry that I don't have any footage of this pouncing process or the inking process. Apparently neither of us thought it was important to take photos or video in the era of Instagram and YouTube. I mean, who would have thought that would be necessary? <sighs> anyway, an important safety note. When you are working with any fine powders, please wear a mask to prevent inhalation. Once or twice inhaling might not cause cancer, but repeated exposure could cause or could result in pulmonary scarring or worse. Fun times, no one wants that. Especially not in the era of COVID, we don't need extra help. Now time to start embroidering, right? Nope. Now that I had full-sized, albeit slightly wonky pattern before me, I needed to consider the types of stitches and the pattern for the stitches. As you can see from these examples, the stitches are not just randomly laid, but in a specific pattern to create a specific effect. Especially when it comes to relucent materials like silk and gold, the method and direction of laying really matters. I settled on cross-hatching, 
for the top half of the leaves of the lily in gold thread with an underside couch technique. Then split stitch in silk for colors following the contours of the leaves and top side couch stitching for the flower and roots with couch stitch for the stamen. I'm, I'm not certain what biological part of the flower these are actually. Hashtag Contessa Brown Thumb. As a side note, split stitch really is my favorite. I fall into a zen-like trance. Do you have a favorite medieval embroidery stitch? Let me know in the comments. So, I drew on the cross hatching using a ruler, but not as professionally as I could have or should have. Dedicated drafters would probably commit seppuku if they produced something this wonky. Underside couching is a great technique for several reasons. One, uh, you can cover a lot of ground fairly quickly. Might be a little frustrating, but it goes quickly. One can also create interesting patterns uh, using the couching pattern. And it perfectly suits fussy, delicate materials such as metallic thread, which does not respond at all well to the sort of violent treatment of being pulled through fabric with no care as to its delicately aristocratic nature. You can see the technique here. Basically, one lays the decorative thread on top, then uses a cheaper, aesthetically indifferent thread to pull the decorative thread under in exactly one spot, through one space in the weave of the ground fabric. Thus, one can create entire patterns using the decorative thread. So, I started with the underside couched gold work on one of the leaves, and then, for a reason that now eludes me in hindsight, decided to unstrategically switch to topside couching of the centerpiece. This was a mistake. In retrospect, I should have filled in the spaces with the red silk thread first, then entombed all that in gold couch threads. Another lesson learned here, I should have planned the pattern for the couching stitches and marked it out on the linen ground. As is, I ended up eyeballing the couch stitches, which looks okay from a respectable distance, but definitely fails upon closer inspection. Okay, granted, if anyone is looking that closely at my sleeve, they should probably be my tailor or my husband, or they might end up with a bruised face. Anyway, contessa violence aside, also for reasons that escape me now, most likely I was absolutely sick of working in gold thread, the Cheater DMC stuff is not an easy material to work with. I moved on to filling in the leaf with the red silk split stitch, which you can see demonstrated here. In essence, a split stitch is a species of back stitch. One lays a stitch and then comes back up from underneath, halfway through the stitch, literally splitting the thread. Split stitches can be utilized to create some delightful textures and curves. And again, filling in the red first was a mistake. I should have started from the inside and worked my way out, meaning commenced by filling in the little blue circles, then the red patch, and then probably going on to the gold. Didn't do that. Anyway. Still suffering from the post-traumatic stress of underside couching the gold thread, I apparently decided to continue with the red silk on the other side, still not having learned the lesson of filling in the blue circles first. <sighs> but eventually, there were no more silk bits to do and I had to go back to the gold work. Or did I? Looking at the relatively flat affect of the first leaf, I realized I should have laid a split stitch edge around the leaf to provide a sort of pillow for the gold stitching, which you can see here. In essence, I did a split stitch outline in red silk around the leaf and then laid the gold stitches over top of that. And that created what I think is a much more interesting bit of contouring. Okay, it could all be in my head, but humor me here. I think it looks better. Okay, the wobbly underside couching component of this project now being complete, I moved on to the top side couching of the roots. And here, I started off with a random, let us be generous and call it alternating couching stitch pattern. But after seeing that effect on this little one part of the root, I decided to try and make it a bit more intentional by doing chevrons with the couching stitches. 
Again, I should have mapped this out on the ground fabric rather than eyeballing it, but I will say that I have seen professional medieval embroideries that definitely involve a bit of mm, free-spirited improvisation. Anyway, you can see the difference in how the light reflects differently off of the chevron patterns versus the freestyle of the first part of the route. One of the big perks of stretching the couching stitches more intentionally is the way the light falls. And, you know, you can see it shines better, I think, the chevrons. So, roots done. I moved up to the lower part of the blossom. More topside couching and chevrons, powdered without a plan. <laughs> Um, so having achieved maximum resentment for the gold thread, I decided to fill in the blue section with split stitches before doing the gold stamen, I guess that is, and blossom top. So I just followed the contours, starting from inside and working my way out until the whole thing was filled in, just like that. <laughs> and then I added the stamen in top side couched gold work and moved up to the top of the blossom to continue with the top side couching still without drawing in the couching pattern. Oh well. I think I must suffer from some sort of oppositional defiance, even when I'm the person being defied. Anyway, that was that. It was done, embroidery finished. Oh well, except for the part about cutting it out and appliquing it to the gown. Which brings us to our lessons learned, dear viewers. I've already harped on mapping out couching stitch patterns, so I shall say no more on that. Rewind if you missed it somehow. But when creating this project, I should have remembered the way that embroidered heraldic fleur-de-lis were created for the armorial of the Duchy of Burgundy. Hopefully I'll be able to insert a picture of that there. Unfortunately, the book that we have that in is in a crate on its way here. Anyway, each separate piece of the lily was created separately, then assembled on the banner to make the whole fleur-de-lis. And why was that? Well, I found out the tearful way. Because you see that narrow space between the leaves and the blossom? Well, that does not leave very much room for cutting, nor any excess fabric for tucking under when appliquing the darned thing on, which meant that there were fraying edges that had to be addressed when I applicate the embroidery onto the sleeves. And that was not easy, I guess actually I could have used some melted beeswax. Oh well, next time. <laughs> it just occurred to me now. Yay! <laughs> Brainstorms in the middle of filming. Okay. Anyway, the second problem, I had to cut so close to the embroidery and parts that many of the underside couch stitches came loose. Again, probably I could have fixed that by pre-applying some beeswax to the edges. Next time. <laughs> anyway, uh, at the time it was hard to fix and it was very frustrating to do so. Now. Had I created this Jiyo in its component parts, leaves, centerpiece, blossom, and roots, each in separate components, none of this would have been an issue anyway. So the big lesson learned, don't reinvent the proverbial embroidery wheel. Follow the techniques and approaches used by our historic forebears. As crazy as this might sound, they know of where they, they know whereof they were about. And here it is, the finished product and the finished product, and some more views of the finished product. So, have you any lessons learned in your embroidery endeavors? If so, share them in the comments below. Maybe we can learn from each other and spare each other some wry, unnecessary tears. Otherwise, let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and stay tuned for your moment of kitty zen. Stay creative. Oh, damn. <laughs> I, I wasn't filming when he did that. Meow. 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 <laughs>